as president of the Salzburg Global Seminar to welcome all of you here to Schloss Leopoldskron for this truly historic gathering. 2014 already has seen many memorials to the destruction unleashed in 1914. As we looked at accelerating crises around the world, we saw an opportunity to use this gathering to do something different, to focus on what lessons from the past could say to us about visions for the future. Edward Mortimer, in his foundation paper for this meeting, reminds us that the Congress of Vienna, which brought together statesmen from across Europe after the ravages of the Napoleonic Wars, established a system that produced a period of relative peace in Europe until it all came crashing down a century later. Edward raises, and this meeting will examine, whether today we are more like the architects of 1914, or like those, excuse me, of 1814, or like those in 1914, sleepwalking their way into a nightmare. We think this offers more than a clever point of departure. Rather, it summons us to serious soul searching, lest our vision, our leadership, fail the tests before us now and produce consequences for the world potentially graver even than the horrors unleashed by the First World War. This gathering has been developed through close cooperation between two institutions, Salzburg Global Seminar and the International Peace Institute. When we discovered one year ago that we were both planning to host events on this historic occasion, we decided to combine efforts. And by the time you leave here, we hope that you will agree with us that dialogue, cooperation, and partnership have triumphed yet again. Salzburg Global Seminar was born in 1947 out of the ravages of another war and was the vision of three students at Harvard University, one a young Austrian, Clemens Heller. They believed that former enemies could together talk and learn and imagine a peaceful future for Europe and for the world. They argued for a Marshall Plan of the mind as a critical element of recovery. Salzburg Global's own frame of reference was stretched much wider during the presidency of Bradford Morse. Before coming to Salzburg, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and legendary director for 10 years of the United Nations Development Program, President Morse took steps to make Salzburg Seminar truly global in scope, especially drawing in participants from East Asia, the Middle East, and other regions. Salzburg Global builds on that legacy today, examining world problems from differing perspectives and providing a safe place where inconvenient truths and new ideas can be expressed. We are as well an incubator for rising leaders and global innovators, providing them a platform and connecting them to one another and to those in positions of influence and power. We're honored and delighted that those here today come not only from countries on six continents, but from different professions and backgrounds. This week offers all of us the opportunity to cross boundaries, not just on the ground, but in our minds. Let me recognize and thank those who have joined with IPI and Salzburg Global to make this event possible. In particular, we thank the foreign ministries of Canada and Norway for their support of this program. I want to end by saluting the International Peace Institute and its extraordinary staff, led, of course, by its president, Terji Rod Larson. At every step along the way, We've been inspired by IPI's commitment to peace and by its ability to persuade outstanding thinkers 
and decision makers to engage. The evidence, well, it's here in this room and will be throughout the next several days. It's now my honor and pleasure to introduce the IPI president, Terji Rond Larson. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning, everybody. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the International Peace Institute to this, I believe, as you do, historic event. I'm very happy to tell you that one of my staff members quipped that this could be the most important meeting in Austria since the Congress of Vienna. <laughs> that might be a slight uh, exaggeration, but let's see. What I do know is that we have assembled a top caliber group of people, look at each other, uh, here to discuss some of the most pertinent issues of the day. And what a wonderful place to do it. This is the beautiful and historic Schloss Leobotskron, and thank you all for coming here. Our aim this week is not to dwell on the past, rather, it is to look through the lens of history, to provide lessons and inspiration for dealing with the crises of today and preparing for the challenges of tomorrow. We have purposely invited people from different backgrounds. We have historians with us. We have journalists. We have diplomats, statesmen, stateswomen. And we have artists in order to take a fresh approach. The very reason why we asked you to come here is that the status quo isn't working, which I think we will hear many examples of in the next couple of days. One thing I would like to stress from the outset, this meeting is designated to promote dialogue. We don't want to hear speeches. Indeed, there are no easy answers. We want to stop and take the time to think together about the world situation and see if we can make it better. I do strongly believe that the collective wisdom and experience that has been brought together here for the next few days can transform the way we think about adaptation to dramatic and rapid changes. Now on some procedural issues. With the exception of this opening session and the panels tomorrow morning, this meeting will take place under Chatham House rule. And that, of course, as you all know, means that you can refer to the content of what was said here, but not to attribute it to the speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, when we started planning this meeting a year ago, the hook was the anniversaries of 1814 and 1914. But so many crises have erupted in 2014 that this meeting is taking on an added significance. I encourage you to use the opportunity of the discussion sessions as well as the more informal sessions to uh, on the palace grounds to debate and discuss ways of enhancing international peace and security. I hope that uh, through our deliberations and policy recommendations, we can develop ideas and maybe recommendations that might have a potential to impact positive changes. I would like to thank the foreign min uh, ministries of Canada and Norway and the ministers themselves, John Baird, who is with us, um, um, the Norwegian Foreign Minister, Mr. Berge Brende, was instructed by his Prime Minister to go on very short uh, notice to um, Iraq. I think it's in Baghdad right now. So he could unfortunately not be with us today. However, I'm very pleased that his deputy, uh, Hans Pratskar, um, a skilled and experienced diplomat, is here in his place. And I would also like to um, thank, once again, uh, the support from uh, Canada and Norway, which has made this event possible. 
I would also like to take this opportunity to thank um, uh, Stephen Salyer, Claire Schein, and the whole team here at the Salzburg Global Seminar for their cooperation. I think we should give them a round of applause. <laughs> and now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, namely Margaret Macmillan. We are very, very lucky to have Margaret here with us because she is arguably the world's greatest expert on the First World War. Her two books on the topic entitled The Peacemakers and most recently the fabulous book The War That Ended Peace are both bestsellers and prize winners. <laughs> Professor Macmillan. is warden of St. Anthony's College in Oxford. She is a professor of international history, a fellow and a board member of many prestigious institutions, and a frequent commentator in the media. She holds several honorary degrees and is a recipient of the Order of Canada. And I was very interested to learn that her great grandfather was David Lloyd George. So thank you for your kind attention and uh, Margaret, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you for being with us. It's all yours. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I, I would say too kind, but um, it was very nice to hear it, so thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank as well the International Peace Institute and the Salzburg Global Seminar for putting this event on and for inviting me to take part in it. It's a great honor and a great pleasure. Pleasure also to be in this extraordinary building and to be in Salzburg in the summer. So thank you all for making this possible. I'm going to, of course, look at this as an historian, and I hope you'll forgive me if I go back to 1814 and the years immediately afterwards, because I think there are some interesting parallels and some interesting thoughts which come out of looking at the past. I'm always wary of lessons from the past, partly because you can find any lesson you want in the past. Um, there's an awful lot of past out there, and if you want to find lessons, if you want to find guidance, you can, I think, find pretty much anything you want. Um, what I think the past can do is act at, like warnings. It can act like the sort of warnings you see when you're driving, which said this road has a dangerous curve ahead, or this road is particularly dangerous in winter, and I think this is what history can help us do. It can offer warnings and some guidance, perhaps, as to how to avoid the pitfalls that others have fallen into in the past. I think 1814, 1914, and 2014, of course, occurred in very different periods, in very different circumstances, but I think there are some interesting and provocative similarities. All, I think it is fair to say, were pivotal moments in world history. We can see it clearly in 1814, that long period of the French Revolutionary Wars and then the Napoleonic Wars came to an end, and a very different world succeeded that period of war. 1914 was the end of that long period of peace, almost unprecedented in European history from 1814 to 1914. There were, it is true, short wars in Europe, but they were generally decisive wars and they generally were over very quickly indeed. And so Europeans could be forgiven for thinking by 1914 that they were living in a world where war was becoming obsolete that it was not something at least they in Europe did anymore, and that they could expect another century of extraordinary progress, peace, and prosperity, because that is what they look back on in 1914. And of course, we know now that 1914 was not going to be the beginning of yet another prosperous century. It was going to be the beginning of one of the worst centuries in Europe and world history. 2014, of course, is more difficult to see because we're in the middle of it. But I think we would all agree that the events that have taken place since the beginning of this year are in themselves worrying and seem to suggest that certain shifts are occurring in the world, certain things are happening in the world, the consequences of which I think will be with us for a long time. And so I think there is real, real value in looking at these three key moments 100 years apart. I think similarities among them all are that they took place in worlds that were in the process of becoming increasingly interconnected. Europe was more interdependent as a result of the Napoleonic Wars, partly because of what those wars themselves did, but
but also because the beginnings of the great transformation of the Industrial Revolution was starting to take place and travel was in the process uh, and communications were in the process of becoming better across Europe. And of course, the period of 1914 was a period of increased interdependence, not just in Europe, but increasingly globally. The great era of globalization before our own was those two decades before the First World War when the world was linked in so many ways and when you had massive movements of capital, of goods, and indeed of people around the world, something that was really only paralleled in the years after the end of the Cold War. I think all three periods, 1814, 1914, and 2014, also were periods in which the very changes that were taking place were causing tremendous strains in society. And I think that is particularly clear in 1914 and 2014. Um, in 1914, there was a very similar concern that we have today about the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, the ways in which the middle classes were being squeezed, the ways in which those who felt themselves somehow to be alienated and marginalized by their own societies were perhaps increasingly prepared to turn to violence. And in the period before 1914, there was increasing worry among Europeans and indeed in, in, in parts of North America as well and South America that the world was becoming um, a dangerous place, that people were resorting more easily to violence, that there was the spread of an international revolutionary movement, which of course is something we fear today. I think we also saw changes in the nature of war in all three periods. The wars of the French Revolution had brought about a very new relationship between the subjects in a particular country and their own governments. People had moved in many European countries, starting of course with France, from being subjects to being citizens. And that brought a very different relationship between those who lived in a country and the wars that that country fought. And the French citizens felt themselves as part owners, or indeed owners, of the French state and, and, and French polity. And that, of course, imposed upon them a corresponding obligation to come to its defense. And so we see in the wars of the French Revolution the beginnings of the movements towards mass war, which were going to become, of course, so much more pronounced in the 19th and 20th centuries. What we're also seeing in our own periods and what they were seeing in 1914, which was something they weren't seeing as much in 1814, was a tremendous change in the technology of war. In the period before 1914, thanks to the very success of European industry in science and technology, Europeans were becoming capable of building enormous armies, sending those armies into the fields, keeping them in the fields for periods which would have been unthinkable in earlier wars, and of course they were becoming much more efficient at killing each other. And I think we, again, are living through a period of rapid technological change in war. I think really not yet because we're in the middle of it clear what it's going to be like, but I think the development of new kinds of weapons, the development of drone technology, for example, the potentials for biological and chemical warfare are something which we are having to confront more and more in our own period. I think what we also see in each period is a balance between those forces that push for war and those forces that push for peace. As an historian, I resist very strongly the idea that, that events in history are inevitable. We can look back and we can see reasons why things happen, but that doesn't mean they had to happen. And I think we need always to keep in mind that there are balances always in societies between those forces that would push towards war and those forces that would push towards peace. And sometimes the forces that are making war more likely tend to win out. Sometimes the forces that make peace more likely win out. And I think we must also take into account individual human agency. Um, I, history, of course, is affected by forces, economic, social, political, uh, intellectual, religious, but I think we also have to be aware that there are key moments in which those who are in positions of power making decisions are very important indeed. I think the First World War, and I believe this strongly, could have been avoided if certain key decision makers in that fateful month of July 1914 had made different decisions or had perhaps in some cases stood up to their own military when those military were urging war. And so we can never abstract or take away the role of human agency and the importance of human leadership in the ways in which history turns out. Let me just say something very briefly about the period after 1814 because I think in some ways it's a period which is less familiar to most of us. I know we have with us a very uh, distinguished historian of, of that period, but I think for a lot of us the period after 1814 is, is more remote and perhaps less familiar than the period after 1914, or of course the period after the end of the Cold War. 
And I think what we need to do is look again at what the Congress of Vienna did. And this was the great Congress of Nations which met in 1814, was briefly interrupted when Napoleon came back from exile and, and had to be defeated yet again at the Battle of Waterloo. And then the Congress of Vienna resumed its work. I think what was very important about the Congress of Vienna was it did not just settle the, 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 the borders, it did not just settle who was going to rule which country, it did not just settle what would happen to France um, as, it was, as it was defeated. What it did was set up a system which actually served Europe very well for the next um, half a century and might have gone on serving it well if, if other things hadn't happened. I think there was a very important shift as a result of the Napoleonic Wars in the thinking of those who came to make peace in Vienna, and that was that they had to build something different. Very much the same sort of attitude you got after 1918 when the peacemakers who met in Paris said, we can't do this again, we can't afford to have a war on this scale again. And very much, I think, the same sort of shift in thinking and sensibility that you got after 1945. Again, when those who were responsible for trying to set up a new world order said, we can't just repeat the sort of mistakes we had in the past and we can't repeat the sort of system we had in the past. And I think the key shift at the Congress of Vienna was a shift from the thinking of the 18th century where international relations were seen very much as a zero-sum game, game, where nations jockeyed for advantage if one, lot, if, if one nation won something, another nation had to lose. And I think what the Napoleonic Wars had done was persuade many of Europe's statesmen that in fact, this was not the right way to manage the international order, that in fact, you could build an international order in which every participant, or at least key participants, had a stake instability and order, that in fact all would benefit by a more stable order, that it wasn't necessarily a zero-sum game, that you could actually move beyond that and build an order in which nations could work together and avoid um, costly and protracted struggles. And what the Concert of Europe, which came out of the, of the Congress of Vienna, did was help to bring the nations of Europe into this sort of understanding, in a sense help to socialize them, help to make them part of a community of nations, help to make statesmen realize that there were other ways of settling disputes. And if you look at the pattern of international relations in Europe, particularly in the first half of the 19th century, you really do see an understanding that disputes can be settled peacefully if the powers agree, if, if the powers can be brought into some sort of understanding with each other, that you can, in fact, build an international order that will work. And you see time and time again in Europe potentially dangerous disputes, the, 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 the fate of Belgium, for example, which is settled by cooperation among the great powers. And I think you get a sense that a new type of world order is, is at least struggling to be emerged. The system, as we know, didn't last. It began to break down with the Crimean War when the great powers, Britain and France, went to war with Russia and that helped to serve, serve to alienate Russia, serve to drive Russia out of what had been a system that it was very much uh, involved with, and I think had a longer term impact on Russia's relations with the rest of Europe. And when Germany began to move towards unification, the Russians were prepared to stand aside, and that had, of course, significant long term consequences for Europe. By 1914, you had a breakdown of that consensus which had emerged after the Napoleonic Wars, and increasingly, states were got reverting to the attitudes of the 18th century, that international relations were an anarchic system in which states jockeyed for advantage, in which someone had to lose and someone had to win. Um, what helped also to feed into that were the ideas of social Darwinism. I think we should never underestimate the importance of ideas in human affairs and in shaping the ways in which we and, and those who are in positions of authority look at the world. And the social Darwinist ideas of the late 19th century, the misapplication of Darwinian theories to human nations, arguing that each human nation was somehow a separate species as it would be in nature, arguing that struggle was a part of the relationship between human species, that they were in fact condemned to struggle with each other, became very much part of the thinking of those in positions of authority, and indeed of many people in European society by 1914. And so you get people saying, what can you do? War is a part of human history. War is something we do. War is necessary. In fact, nations that won't struggle, nations that aren't prepared to fight, don't deserve to survive. And so I think you get a very dangerous breakdown in that consensus 
which had helped to provide a sort of stability and peace in Europe. Well, as you know, the war of 1914-1918 was a war unlike a, a war that most people in Europe had, had seen or had expected. Um, there were a few people in Europe who expected that the war would be long and protracted because of what was happening with technology and because of the enormous industrial capacity of European societies to organize themselves and put troops into the field. But they were very much lone voices in the wilderness and they tended to be dismissed. And one of the great um, prophets of what the First World War was going to be like was a Russian banker called Ivan Bloch who wrote a six volume history of war saying that Europe is in danger of getting itself into a dreadful stalemate out of which no country will, will emerge a winner and societies will be destroyed, old orders will topple because of the strains that such a war will impose. And he was dismissed by many of those in positions of authority because what did he know? He was a Russian, he was a Jew who'd converted to Christianity, he was a banker, he was a civilian, all these things uh, were used as ways of dismissing him. Um, alas, he was, he was in fact prophetic um, in his recognition of what was happening. And so Europeans went into the First World War believing or wanting to believe that it would be a short and decisive war. And as we know, it wasn't. It was a war that turned into a dreadful war of stalemate, particularly on the Western Front. On the Eastern Front, what you got was a three-cornered struggle went with neither of the three corners emerging victorious. Um, the Russians could defeat the Austrians, but the Germans could defeat the Russians. And so the struggle went on until eventually, in the case of Russia and Austria-Hungary, those two countries began to collapse under the strain of war. Europe was left in 1918 badly damaged. It had thrown away much of its wealth, thrown away much of its advantage in the world. It had gone from being the most powerful part of the world now to a very much depleted part of the world. Its empires were beginning to shake. And of course, new powers, including most importantly, the United States, were now emerging much more strongly onto the world stage. The dreadful thing, I think, for many people about the First World War is that it caused enormous damage. It destroyed empires. It brought about the end of the Russian Empire and, of course, the birth of Bolshevism in Russia with long-term consequences for the 20th and 21st centuries. It destroyed the Austro-Hungarian Empire and it destroyed, in the end, the Ottoman Empire, which meant that there were going to be tremendous changes on the map of Europe. And I think what appalled people about the First World War is that all those changes didn't bring a period of peace and stability. What they did, in fact, was usher in a, peace, a, a period of instability. The First World War, for all its cost, for all its expense, for all it had done to societies, did not settle things. And although I don't believe that it led directly to the Second World War, I think that a 20-year period um, is a long period to say that something that happens in 1918 leads directly to 1939, it did help that war did help to create the conditions in which the Second World War took place. I think it's fair to say that we would not have had a Second World War of that particular kind and that particular horror without what had happened in 1914, 1918. Those who went to Paris in 1918 realized something of what had happened, realized something of how European societies had been shaken to the core, and realized something of what that meant to the world, because it wasn't just Europe that had been engaged in the war. In the end, of course, the European empires were engaged, the United States was engaged, China came in, uh, Japan came in, as did a number of Latin American countries. And the consequences of that war, while they were felt, I think, much more sharply in Europe, were, were I think, truly worldwide. And I think what you got after 1918 was both a shocked recognition of what Europe had done to itself and what that might mean for the world, but also, I think, a very genuine attempt to build a better sort of world order. Um, it's very easy to criticize those who met in Paris to try and make peace because they didn't, in fact, build a better world order. Um, they didn't, in fact, prevent another war from happening. But I think they tried, at least some of them tried, and some of them tried harder, of course, than others. Uh, the tragedy, I think, of the peacemaking in 1919 and immediately afterwards was that the objective conditions for peace simply were not there. Um, unlike the Congress of Vienna, when the French revolutionary forces had burned themselves out, when Napoleon had been completely defeated, when Europe was ready for peace, what you had after 1918 were, in many cases, rising revolutionary forces, 
not just Bolshevism, which was going to become an example for similar movements around the world, but also the rising revolutionary forces of ethnically based nationalisms, which were almost impossible to contain and almost impossible to satisfy. And the peacemakers in Paris found themselves having to try and draw boundaries for ethnically based states in the center of a Europe where the ethnicities were completely mixed up. Um, when they finally came to some sorts of borders after 1919, something like a third of all the people living in the center of Europe were ethnic minorities in the states in which they found themselves. And these now were ethnically based states. And so, for example, in Czechoslovakia, you had a state based on a Czech and Slovak ethnicity in which there were large numbers of Hungarians and Germans who always felt themselves to be marginalized. This, I think, is not the fault of the peacemakers. This was the fault of the long period of history which had left this jumble of peoples at the center of Europe. And unfortunately, ethnic nationalism is not sympathetic to such jumbles. Ethnic nationalism looks at us and them. We belong here, they don't belong here. And so often, there are exceptions, but so often ethnic nationalism is tied to possession of a particular piece of land. Um, this land must be ours, and those who don't belong here must somehow be either absorbed, um, assimilated, or of course got rid of. Um, the ethnic minorities problems in the center of Europe were solved, as you know, by murder, by genocide, and by forced migration. Um, it, is, it, 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 it was not a way, of course, that any liberal international order would want to solve it, but that, that is in the end what happened. And so I think the objective conditions for peace were not there after 1919. But what did happen, I think, again, was a rethinking of the international order. And the ideas that were associated with Woodrow Wilson, but by, were no, by, by no means were his ideas alone. Ideas of building a league of nations, ideas of building international institutions, ideas of building international law, ideas of finding alternative solutions to conflict between nations for settling disputes. And many of the, these ideas had been around in the world before 1914. The whole notion of arbitration, for example, as a way of settling disputes among nations had been there since the 1790s. And you could see in the course of the 19th century a real trend developing. There were some 300 arbitrations to settle disputes between nations between 1794 and 1914. More than half of those 300 were held after 1890. And so many of the ideas which Woodrow Wilson and others drew on in the aftermath of the First World War, in fact, were ideas that had been around for some time but the First World War made them seem that much more salient and that much more important. And so there was a very genuine attempt made after 1919, after 1918, in, in, in the conference at 1919, to build a new world order, to build some form of international structures or international institutions which would try and, and mitigate um, the horrors of conflict between nations. And I think there were also um, strong Again, feelings, attitudes that the more the world could be linked together, the more trade could be freed up. For example, the more economically interdependent the world would become, um, the safer it would be and the more uh, likely it would be to be stable. Well, as we know, it didn't happen. But again, I think it was an honorable attempt. And those ideas, like the ideas that came to be commonplace after the Congress of Vienna, didn't disappear. And in 1945, a renewed attempt was made to try and build an international world order, drawing on the experience of the 1920s and 1930s, but drawing on those older traditions, that there must be some way of having a world order um, as an alternative to anarchy, in which nations simply constantly are at each other's throats trying to gain advantage or trying to protect itself. And so in the period after 1945, the United States, which had for various complicated reasons not engaged fully with the world order after 1919, did become committed to the building of the United Nations, did become committed to the building of a, a large number of international institutions. And although the Cold War intervened, it did, luckily for all of us, not become a hot war. And gradually, and you can see this as the Cold War went on, the, the Soviet Union, be, was, be, which was becoming increasingly a conservative power, was drawn in to an engagement with other nations, drawn into becoming part of an international community. And China, of course, eventually, by the 1970s, was drawn in as well. Well, we're now seeing again what had been a system which brought us a period of peace um, being challenged, being undermined. 2014 perhaps marks the end 
of that period of internationalism and international cooperation which we saw since 1945. Uh, we see increasing unilateralism on the part of certain powers which have undermined the system, most recently, of course, um, President Putin in Crimea and, and now in Ukraine. And it may be that we're now living through a period of change, much as people lived through the period of the fading of the Congress of Vienna system and then the failure of the League of Nations system. So are there some lessons we can take from those earlier two periods? Um, I'm not sure, again, that we have very clear lessons, but I think there are a certain number of things that we need to take very seriously indeed. We have to somehow come to a way of dealing with the struggle, which is always there in societies and in the international orders between the forces of stability and change. How do we manage to contain change without preventing it? How do we manage to um, preserve stability? Another problem which they had to deal with then in the aftermath of both those earlier struggles, and I think we still have to deal with them, is how do we deal with the end of empires? And we tend not to think in terms of empires these days because most of them have disappeared, but they had to deal in the past with the end of Austria-Hungary as an empire, and the Ottomans as an empire. How do you deal with the emergence of peoples out of the wreckage of empires? And I think we're seeing the same today with the emergence of the countries around the periphery of the old Soviet Union. Um, how, do we, how do we collectively deal with states that are often new and shaky, that are emerging out of empires where they haven't had um, the autonomy and the experience. And I think um, this is one of the problems. How do we deal with public opinion? Public opinion has become increasingly important since the beginning of the 19th century. It is a factor which has to be dealt with. Every government has to be aware of it. How do we manage public, I don't mean manage it in a way of telling the public what to think, but how do we deal with public opinion? And I think this is becoming more difficult than ever because public opinion is now so fluid and has so many different media in which it can express itself. I mean, in the recent um, troubles in Ferguson, um, Missouri, um, apparently uh, Twitter has been providing much more current and up-to-date um, reporting than, than, than newspapers or, or, or the, the, the more conventional media. Um, but this is not necessarily always a good thing because it can um, often be misleading and dangerous. These are just issues we have to deal with. How do we deal with the dangers of local conflicts which have what possible wider repercussions where you have great power interests. They didn't do it very well in the Balkans before 1914 where local conflicts drew in great power interests. I think we see the same dangers today possibly in the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria and certainly in the South and East China seas today where local conflicts can get overlaid by great power conflicts. Um, how do we deal with the need to build confidence among nations? How do we deal with bringing in nations which feel themselves to be alienated from the international uh, system? I mean, I think, again, as they knew then, um, statesmanship and leadership and diplomacy are very, very important tools here. I think we have particular challenges at the present, which perhaps they didn't have in the previous periods, 1914 and, and 1814. I think the interlocking nature of the global order is unprecedented. Certainly in 1814 and in 1914 there were connections among parts of the world, but I think the world is now much more interlocked so that a crisis in one part of the world can have repercussions almost instantly in another part of the world. How do we build international institutions and norms that will work? How do we prop up those which we have? I mean, this I think is something we're really dealing with at the moment. How do we deal, and I'm not throwing these out in any particular order, but I think they're things that will probably come up. How do we deal with the shift in power which seems to be occurring in the international system? Uh, we are probably living through the end of the American hegemony, which certainly we saw from the end of the Cold War. The United States is still a very powerful nation, but relatively, is le it, relatively it is less powerful in comparison to other nations than it might once have been. It is still the world's leading military power, it may be, according to the economists, take, overtaken by China as the world's greatest economic power, or at least the world's um, greatest, uh, with the world's greatest GDP. Not yet, um, will, the United States will not be yet overtaken as the world's greatest military power. But these are things which perhaps we will see um, in some of our lifetimes. Will there be another hegemon? Will China be prepared to play the role that the United States and Britain before it played in maintaining a world order? Or will we have a series of regional hegemons with no world hegemon? I think it's very, very difficult to see. How do we deal with identity politics? Um, this is something which continues to plague 
the international order and continues, of course, to plague societies. And we're seeing now in Iraq what had been loose, often very loose, religious identities, Shi, Sunni, Yazdi, Kurd, uh, uh, sorry, Kurds, Kurds uh, can be Shi or Sunni, Christian, um, hardening into what are something, what are much closer to ethnic identities. And what we're seeing, I think, in Iraq is identities which were once exclusively religious now becoming in some way um, ethnic and religious identities in which those who purport to speak for their particular co-religionists, whether Sunni or Shi, are no longer simply talking about religion but are now talking in terms of land and are now beginning to do what we saw happening elsewhere in the world in earlier periods, um, they're beginning to carry out cleansing of those they think don't belong in their particular pieces of land. I mean, what's happening in the north of Iraq today is an appalling example of what can happen when such identities become these exclusive sort of identities which turn on others. How do we deal with some of the enormous problems that the world is facing? And these are not just political problems. How do we deal with the environmental issues which affect the world as a whole? How do we deal with competition for resources? I mean, water, for example, is increasingly becoming um, a, war, a, a resource which I think is, is capable and has been capable of causing conflicts. How do we deal with the economic instabilities in the world? I mean, we came through a very difficult period after 2008, but we are by no means out of the woods. And I think um, there is, there's a good deal of reason to fear that the economic system worldwide is much more fragile than we might like to think. How do we deal with the social issues? I referred to it earlier, the gap between the rich and the poor. How do we deal with unstable regimes? How do we deal with the tremendous growth of refugees now? I and mean, it's estimated that there are some 51 million people in the world who are now refugees. And this is a huge strain, not just for individual countries, but for the international system. How do we deal with health issues? And the spread of Ebola, I think, has, has shown us just how necessary it is to deal with disease which spreads beyond border. And how do we deal um, with our own electorates who may be disillusioned, um, disenchanted with um, the politics. I mean, one of the great problems it seems to me the European Union has is that people are forgetting why it was so necessary. As the generations go by, people forget why it was that the European Union seemed so important and was so valuable after 1945. Well, I've talked too long. I've, I've disregarded the chairman's talk about not making speeches. I, I apologize. But I'd like to just leave us, if I may, with four questions. Um, that we might consider. Uh, can we hope that there has been progress over the past 20 years in international relations? For all the failures in international relations, can we hope that we have moved ahead a little bit? We, we seem to have to relearn things every so often, but can we hope that we have learned that it is important to try and build a system that people can invest in and that we have to keep building it? Um, is international law order breaking down or is it changing? Can we remain hopeful that we can continue to build? Can we continue to talk of a world community with shared values and rules and respect for the rights and interests of others? And perhaps on a grander and, and more abstract level, can we talk about international order at all? Um, is there something called international order? If there is, is it always going to be a work in progress? And do we simply have to resign ourselves to that? Well, um, I'm not... I'm feeling a bit like a teacher saying we've got an exam at the end of the week, and I don't mean that at all. But I think there are some questions we may want to consider, and, and perhaps the very consideration of them may help us to become clearer about what it is we need and about what it is that we can all collectively do. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think everybody here wants you to talk to for eternity because this was really great. May I now give the floor to um, uh, Hans Bratskar, who is the uh, Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of Norway, for his remarks. And then I will ask the panelists to take, to take the chairs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tadi and uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here with you today. Uh, as you heard, I said earlier, uh, my foreign minister, Mr. Birgit Brande, would have very much uh, liked to have been here with you today, but he, uh, on very short notice, had to go uh, on uh, a very important uh, uh, mission. But um, I would also like to, to thank the Salzburg Global Seminar and the International Peace Institute for organizing this, uh, 
I would say, very timely uh, symposium. And I think that, as we heard earlier, uh, I think that uh, even a year ago we wouldn't have uh, predicted the number of issues that we have the opportunity to discuss here uh, today. And also to thank the, the Canadian government for uh, its uh, very important support of, uh, uh, of um, uh, this symposium this week. And uh, a warm thank you to you, uh, Professor Macmillan, uh, for a very inspiring uh, keynote uh, address. I think your um, uh, thoughts around lessons learned of 1814 and 1914 is ab absolutely fascinating, and also some of the lessons that we can learn in the world of uh, 2014 should uh, certainly lead to in interesting discussions in the days to come. But we do uh, indeed need to uh, learn uh, from, the uh, from history as we look at uh, and deal with the many challenges of our still quite young uh, century. One um, very simple uh, but very important lesson learned it is that it's very difficult to predict developments and events. Who would have thought only one year ago that borders in Europe once again would be changed by the use of force? Rus Russia's annexation of Crimea was a serious violation of international law. And who would have predicted that our relationship with Russia during the last few months would go uh, from uh, sanctions, th through stages of sanctions, or as our lawyers uh, call it, uh, restrictive uh, measures, to talks, the horrific downing of MH17, new restrictive measures and countermeasures by Russia. We have a very different relationship with our great neighbor to the east than we did only a year ago. And this is just one of many events of 2014 that make me certain that this will be a year that historians will discuss for generations to come. We do believe that the best way to prepare for the unknown is to be act according to our principles and values based on universal issues such as democracy, human rights, international law, and multilateral cooperation through the United Nations and other international and regional bo bodies. It's a simple lesson, but in a time of uncertainty, a very important one. Another lesson is, as Professor Macmillan said, that decisions made by individuals matter. And we have certainly seen President Putin make such decisions in 2014. The responsibility Resting on the shoulders of political decision makers is just as heavy today as it was in 1814 or 1914. We continue to live in a world where decisions made by the few can have terrible consequences for us all. Today the security of a country depends on even more factors than in 1814 or 1914. In our changing world, it is vital that the European democracies and our allied friends further strengthen our cooperation on issues that are important for a common f uh, future, such as security, with all the complex issues falling within that uh, challenge, trade and development cooperation with countries in the South, human rights, respect for international law, and the uh, responsibility that we have to fight poverty around the world and to deal with the issue of climate change. And I hope that we will also have ample time to discuss some of these issues this week. History will judge us, maybe at another seminar here in Salzburg in 2114. I hope that our grandchildren will see that we try to make, uh, base our decisions on the values and principles in which we all believe. Well, thank you for your attention. I then ask the panelists to uh, take their chairs. Thank you.
since I uh, started in um, my somewhat uh, jet-lagged mind to wish everybody good morning at 5.30 in the afternoon, <laughs> maybe I should start by saying good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> uh, I think we've listened to um, two very interesting uh, interventions. And uh, if I should try to, uh, crystalline, to crystallize in my jet-lagged mind, uh, what the main uh, or the core of the analysis, uh, obvious, Margaret, um, it is that what happened in 1914 is that you had two empires which were crumbling, namely the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian uh, Empire being on the verge of crumbling because of na the nationalities issues, etc., the Balkans. And then uh, today, maybe we are not seeing empires crumbling, but what we maybe are seeing is a U.S. which is withdrawing from uh, international affairs, both in the, in the Middle East, but also uh, in Europe. And what we see is a Europe which is expanding into what was the old Soviet domain. And uh, I have a friend who uh, spoke to um, a very, very senior Russian official re recently, and he asked the Russian official, why, I mean, you worked so well with Europe and uh, with President Obama at the beginning. But now there is animosity and conflict. What is the reason for this? And the senior Russian official uh, uh, answered, because they're taking away my friends. So, and what he was implying is that uh, the European Union is trying to, I'm looking at the map, is trying to expand into the former Soviet domain. And, and that this has created the animosity. And this brings me back to, um, to, uh, to Germany. Uh, before in 1914, because Bismarck was the master uh, balancer. He understood that Germany could expand, but it could not expand so ferociously that it created alliances against it. So uh, my question is actually to, to all three of you. Is something similar happened, but in a different way? It is the road you described, where you can see there's a sharp curb, there's a yellow light, there is a red light. Are these red lights blinking now? Is the folly of empire in 1914 in a different way uh, repeating itself today? If I, if I may, I, I, actually I say this very deliberately uh, because we have two Canadians here. Because an historian, which I read recently, said the following, that uh, Russia with the Ukraine uh, is like the United States in Eurasia, but Russia without uh, Ukraine, is like Canada, mostly snow. <laughs> <laughs> and oil. Uh, maybe, 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 John, uh, since you are the foreign minister of, of Canada, John, of course everybody knows John, how many ministerial postings have you had, John? Six, seven? Ten. Ten. Okay. I can't keep a job. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you can speak well on behalf of Canada. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to comment? I just say at first, um, 1814, the War of 1812 uh, for Canada was, in many respects, the war that secured uh, Canada, British North America as an independent state of the United States. Uh, so the last two years we've done a lot of uh, work to mark that historical milestone. Um, and 2000, and uh, 1914 also really was the beginning of Canada be fully assuming its place as an independent nation state up until uh, 1914, um, uh, you know, we didn't have a foreign minister or foreign policy. Um, when Britain declared war, we automatically were there. And um, 2014 certainly is an interesting um, time to be a, a foreign minister. I think we're seeing a fundamental challenge to our world order, and it's manifesting itself in a number of ways. I won't mention them all, but I'll mention two. I mean, what we see from Moscow is one man in the Kremlin determined to assert himself and his people. Um, obviously, you can see this, you know, early on, whether it was South Ossetia, whether it was um, in Moldova, Transnistria, whether it's in Crimea, but also on the values front with his persecution of religious minorities. Of, uh, sorry, of sexual minorities. Um, and this is really challenging the world order, and it's really exposed, in my judgment, unfortunately, just how weak our institutions are 
uh, to be able to, to respond to that challenge. The, the second challenge is one that has manifested itself uh, over many years, but increasingly so today, and that's the struggle against extremism and terrorism. I, I often speak of my grandfather, who was a real mentor to me. He went uh, to Europe in uh, 1943 and then stayed in the Canadian forces for uh, 25 years, and the great struggles of his generation uh, were fascism and, uh, and communism. Well, the great struggle of our generation is, uh, is terrorism, and it manifests itself in a whole host of ways. So there's two areas which are just fundamentally challenging our, uh, the world order, and we've got to look at how have we been in responding to that challenge. I look at the situation in Ukraine, which is deeply disturbing for, uh, for Canada, for Canadians, and it, the reaction among some quarters has been a surprise. Um, you know, some will you know, quietly point out, well, Crimea really is Russian territory, so it's okay, or you, know, you don't understand because you know, we have strong economic interests in our relationship with, uh, with Russia, so an economic equation. And um, I'm not sure where that's leading us, but it does, for, at least for me, cause a huge concern. Thank you, John. Um, so you do think that there is an imperial ambition in Russia these days to restore not only the Soviet empire, but <coughs> the uh, Tsarist empire? I don't know whether I would put it that way, but um, sometimes people um, are very honest and upfront with what their views are. And when you have one man in the Kremlin who has been very clear that um, you know, the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a catastrophe, um, and then you look at a series of actions, and as like I said, Georgia, Moldova, and now Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, I think it's not hard to, to, to draw that conclusion. And it's not, it's not so much a, a rebuilding an empire, but wanting to rebuild uh, Russia as a superpower. And unfortunately, it's coming at the exact same time when, uh, as Professor McMillan mentioned, uh, you know, the, the shadow of the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. And, you know, uh, I'm a Canadian. I want to see a strong United States projecting its values, uh, projecting its power in the world for good. And uh, uh, obviously, that's... Uh, for many of us, uh, we've been concerned, not just frankly, and it's not a situation, I think it would be a mistake to say it's just the administration, it's the Congress, but it's also fundamentally about the American people who are becoming uh, increasingly isolationist. And it's a mistake to just look at you know, the White House or just look at Capitol Hill, because I think it is very deep-rooted in the uh, American people. So going back to my, uh, my Canadian uh, metaphor, uh, you don't think that the European Union and the West are being too aggressive in order to lure former Soviet republics uh, into the Western fold and more formally into the European Union and to NATO? And that this actually has been a mistake because you tilted the balance of power. I mean, when you walk through, as I did, the Maidan uh, in the center of Kiev, Kiev, I mean, you see the you know, a sea of European Union flags. It's what people aspire to. It's not governments. Uh, it's not uh, in, in Brussels or in London or in Paris or Berlin. These are what uh, the people of Ukraine aspire to. Um, and it's not just uh, prosperity, but it's also a freedom. It's also uh, lashing out at cronyism and corruption. And uh, I, I've said this uh, many times to Catherine Ashton. I'm a conservative from Canada, and if I was a British conservative, I'd probably be a mild Eurosceptic. Having said that, my three and a half years as foreign minister, uh, I see the European Union as a powerful force for good, uh, of common values, uh, of open economies, free societies. And that's what, in my judgment, what people uh, on the street in, uh, in Kyiv want. That's what they aspire to, and uh, it's not like um, it's not like uh, uh, you know Brussels has some sort of imperial ambitions to uh, you know to, to to grow the team. It's uh, it's they have uh, desires to, to share what uh, what has been accomplished in the EU.
Thank you again. Um, Edward. Uh, Edward is, of course, uh, uh, with the uh, Salzburg Global Seminar, and he was the leader here for several years. And uh, Edward is also a former colleague of mine. We both worked for uh, Kofi Annan. Uh, Edward was uh, probably the best speechwriter in the in UN history, and uh, uh, served as um, the Secretary General exceedingly well, and I saw it at very close range. And uh, Edward is also an accomplished historian. So, Edward. Does uh, Russia have an imperial ambition? Has, wait, has, uh, has uh, the West done a mistake by being too rash, too reckless in its ambitions in uh, encompassing uh, former Soviet republics in its, uh, in, its, uh, uh, in its domain? And my third question, which has been kind of implicit in what we've been discussing uh, so far, is, uh, is there a US withdrawal from international affairs? Uh, in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, uh, and maybe elsewhere. And is this encouraging both uh, states and uh, non-governmental organizations, as we see in many places, particularly these days in Iraq and Syria, uh, to um, uh, move in and fill the vacuum that the US has left? Well, I'd be very unwise to call myself an accomplished historian in the present well, company, but I also think that Margaret might share my amusement that you think an accomplished historian would be the right person to answer those questions. <laughs> um, she's written very eloquently about the uses and abuses of history, and uh, um, I think we've seen a good deal of both in recent times. And um, some, I remember. In, Hungary in the early post-Cold War years, I think they had a historian as their foreign minister, and um, he was perpetuating, in a way, all the worst kind of ethnic myths, and we see some of those coming back to haunt us now in present Hungarian policy. Um, so I think I would give an opinion not as a historian, um, but as a journalist, and as, as you say, somebody who's tried in a small way to help make the international system work. Um, I think... I think calling names isn't particularly helpful. Um, in empires where uh, you know, established uh, phenomena of 1814 and more especially of 1914, and they're not actually, you know, nobody calls themselves an empire now, um, and um, probably to say that Putin has an imperial ambition doesn't get us much further. I mean, I think it clearly is true that he is not alone among Russians in feeling that they have somehow been dealt a very bad hand by the post-Cold War developments, and um, that other people have taken advantage of this. And uh, he is trying to regain something, restore self-respect to his own people. And, um, you know, of course I deplore the methods that he's used as much as anybody, but I think it probably does help to have some understanding of that. Uh, we should remember that Ukraine and Russia had been, well, first of all, that the Russian state originates in Ukraine. It was Kievan Rus in the time of St. Vladimir. And secondly, that Ukraine and Russia have, were part of the same polity from 1654 uh, until uh, 1991. That's quite a sizable chunk of history. So, um, of course, the Ukrainians have a right to determine their own destiny. But the famous ethnic patchwork that Margaret was talking about, uh, unfortunately, affects Ukraine as it affects other parts of Central and Eastern Europe, and indeed parts of Western Europe, as um, in my country we are very well aware. You, you talked, Margaret, about, um, in the Middle East, religious divisions becoming ethnic divisions. Well, my goodness, we know about that in Ireland, and we have known it for quite a long time. So I think the fact is that Ukrainians are clearly not completely united about their identity. And um, by and large, the Russian-speaking minorities have gone along with the breakup of the Soviet Union and maybe seen some advantages in it. Uh, but when push comes to shove, uh, they feel worried <coughs> about being militarily reconquered by the government in Kiev, and some of them are willing to look to Russia for help. And that is a very dangerous situation. Now, second question, is the West too expansionist? 
not in an old-fashioned and conventional way, but I think you raise a very interesting question because we we all know about soft power now, and um, uh, you know probably we'll have a statue to Joe Nye somewhere as the inventor of this wonderful concept. Uh, but it's an interesting thought that soft power can also be expansionist and can dis be disturbing to some of the people on the receiving end of it. And this may be a way to interpret some of the ethnic um, and um, sectarian um, reactions that we're seeing. Um, I remember back in the days when I was an FT columnist, um, and it was the, the time of um, the wars in the Balkans, and I interpreted these partly as a reaction to globalization, that if you are living in a period of very rapid stress and change and insecurity, uh, and I think Margaret is right that that is something that we do have in common with 1814 and 1914, um, then you tend to try and grab hold of what's familiar. And you may assert it or reassert it in ways that you wouldn't have felt the need to in the past. And I think in some cases that's an ethnic identity, and in some cases it's a religious identity. And I think that was already visible in some parts of the world. Um, you might remember that um, Benjamin Barber wrote a book called Jihad versus McWorld. Um, that was already visible in the 1990s, but I think it's become even more so now. And so then your third question, um, is there a US withdrawal um, and uh, is it leaving space which other states and NGOs are moving into? Yes, I think that's true. And it, but again, I think it's not necessarily purely a deliberate policy. I mean, there are many Americans who would accuse Obama of that and say, you know, he, he's handing over the world to all these people. Um, I think it's more what Margaret said, that there is a reordering of the pecking order. I mean, we lived, we've lived through an extraordinary, really very unusual period. First of all, between 1945 or six or seven and 1989, um, with this bipolar world order, which is certainly not typical of most of history. Um, and then we had Charles Krauthammer's famous unipolar moment, in which it really looked as though Nobody could stand up to the United States. Um, and I think that was never going to last. I think, you know, I don't agree with Krauthammer about most things, but I think he was right that that was a moment that was not going to last. Um, and I'm afraid I think that George W. Bush greatly accelerated the end of it by the very misguided use he made of the wrong kind of power in the wrong place. That's probably enough. Uh, and I'm sure Margaret has better answers to all of your questions. <laughs> Thank you, May Thank you very much, uh, Edward. Um, not an accomplished historian. I don't think you convinced us on, convinced us on that. <laughs> but anyhow, so we move to the accomplished historian. Can you uh, touch upon the three? Of course, you've already commented on the three questions in your, uh, your main intervention, but maybe you would like to elaborate a little bit on those uh, three questions. And then I have another one for you afterwards. Um, I, I'm trying to remember them in order, but... Um, Russia as, as an expansionist, yes. uh, just a new uh, imperial yeah. ambition there. And then mistakes by the West in being too aggressive, tilting uh, the balance, particularly yeah. re related to uh, not only uh, the Ukraine, but maybe also uh, for other yeah. former Soviet re republics. Some of them are represented here uh, this afternoon. Uh, and... Um, US. Uh, yeah, I think these are the two, uh, two main ones, yeah. Well, all fascinating ones. I mean, I think um, to take the last first, I mean, the United States, in a way, we're all going to get what we thought we wished for, and that is a less engaged United States. And we're now realizing that this may not be a very easy world in which to live because it's not clear how the world is going to manage itself. Um, I think the United States has made some really bad mistakes. I mean, I would um, agree partly with what um, my foreign minister said and partly disagree and I think where I disagree with you is the notion of the war on terror. Um, I think that when the United States declared a war on terror it, it left an open-ended um, notion and an open-ended process. I mean how do you know when you won the war on terror? I mean it's, it's, it's I think it's, 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 I find the analogy. A struggle, not a war. You struggle, yeah fair enough but the US calls it a war on terror um, and I, I, I can see that the use of terror to carry out, uh, to achieve political ends is, is deeply troubling. I think particularly for so societies like ours, which believe in persuasion and, and democratic um, consensus. 
but I'm not sure it is actually going to destabilize our societies in, in the same ways that other things might. Um, and I think in a way we run the danger of ascribing too much power to the acts of terrorists. Um, so often what they do is, is hurt the people around them, but don't actually bring down societies and certainly don't bring about great change. And their, their power seems to be entirely destructive. And there are many types of terrorists carrying out terrorist activities for different ends. And I think we need to look at them with discrimination. In many cases, I think terrorism can be dealt with by better policing. And I think some of the great successes in dealing with terrorism have, in fact, been through very effective uh, international cooperation and, and policing. Um, I think I would agree with, with Edward Mortimer on, on George W. Bush accelerating um, the, both the, the perception of the United States, the decline, the perception of decline of the United States, um, accelerating antagonism of the United States, and I think actually damaging the international system. And I think by going into Iraq, and certainly the British bear responsibility for this as well, by going into Iraq, um, without clearly defined objectives, by really acting unilaterally, I think, in defiance of the internationalist system, they have helped to weaken a system which they themselves have benefited from. And I think this is dangerous. I mean, I think international systems are always in trouble when you get too many significant, significant players, and Russia clearly is one today, who don't want to play by the rules and who are revisionist powers like Hitler was and Mussolini was and the Japanese militarists were in the 1930s, who don't see any value in adhering to the system because it doesn't bring them any benefits and they're prepared to try and destroy it. And I think that's dangerous. And I think, unwilling, unwittingly, I think, um, the United States, by its actions in Iraq, um, helped to weaken a system which, in fact, itself wants to prop up. And I think it, it is now paying, I think, part of the price for that. Um, how the American public will react is very difficult to tell. American politics strike me as very volatile at the moment and, and very fluid, and it's very difficult to know. I mean, on, you, it's very difficult. I mean, we were just about to get into what seemed like interminable American election, presidential election campaigns, and they will at some point be talking about foreign policy, and it'll be very interesting to see where those go. Um, mistakes by the West, well, the mistakes we made, I think, were, were, were not as serious as the mistakes which Russia is now making. But I think we, treat, we, we were tactless. We treated Russia with contempt after the end of the Cold War. We made it feel negligible. And that is a mistake. I mean, Bismarck always said, and I think rightly, Russia is never as strong as it seems, nor as weak. And it's a very big country with a great deal in the way of resources, with a very strong sense of itself. And to marginalize it and treat it as though it didn't count, to tell it, that, you know, become like us, do you know, our way is so much better, was foolish. Um, but I think foolishness is one thing. I think what Putin's doing is, is, is much worse. I mean, I think he is deliberately um, defying the international system. He's telling the most blatant lies without really, I think, expecting anyone to believe them. Um, he seems to me to show nothing but contempt for public opinion. And I do think, um, in some ways, he's very influenced by Russian history. I mean, he's, he's constantly calling on it. And he, he has been heard to say, as my predecessor Peter the Great once said, you know, this, this I find worrying. Um, now, it may be just that he's using it, but it does seem to me he has a very lively sense. And in a sense, I would argue that he is trying to rebuild the old Russian Empire. You know, and if I were Kazakhstan these days, I'd be pretty nervous. Or Latvia, Estonia, or Lithuania. They're sitting right Sorry. there. Perhaps, well, you don't look nervous. But. <laughs> But, no, but I think he, 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 he is... I will open the floor in a minute. Yeah, but he's very conscious of, of what used to be Russia. And I think this does affect him. And he's, you know, the way in which he's um, pushed in, in education, in the Russian schools, he's been pushing a sort of triumphalist view of, of Russian history. And I find it very, very worrying. And of course, what he's done now, it seems to me, is he has sort of stimulated and unleashed um, the powers of Russian nationalism. I think he has to ride it now. And I think it's going to be more difficult for him to back down because he's got, you know, very dangerous for politicians when they have 99% approval, it seems to me, or whatever it is he has. It's very high. It means that his room to maneuver is much less. Thank you very much. Can I shift the topic uh, slightly um, to, uh, and I will start with the Middle East, because, um, I mean, Europe has uh, seen uh, religious fundamentalism, uh, which... Uh, um, legitimized uh, terror as a, as a means to uh, maintain, to, to grab power and maintain power, and even seeing it as a necessity in order to do it. And we've seen the same arguments in uh, fascism, Nazism, and communism. When you look at the ideologies of the um, 
uh, groups of political Islam in the Middle East these days, uh, many of the programs are pretty similar. They are totalitarian, mm. they see terror as legitimate, they see terror as necessary in order to achieve uh, their goals, and some of them actually have programs which have striking similarities to the programs of fascism and uh, Nazism. For instance, Hamas claims that um, in its um, charter that uh, the Jews were responsible for the French Revolution, the uh, Russian Revolution, the First World War, and the Second World War. And they quote the same uh, sources as Alfred Rosenberg uh, did, namely the uh, Protocols of the uh, Wise of Zion. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's explicit uh, in there, and calls for the eradication not only of Israel, but of the Jewish people globally. Is this um, fascism and Nazism uh, with a new coat? Well, should I? Yes. I, mean, I think it is. I mean, I, I think it actually doesn't have that much to do with religion. I think religion is an excuse. And there have been some very interesting articles recently about how little many of these people who claim to be right, acting in the name of Islam actually know about it. Um, you know, a lot of them haven't read the Quran, a lot of them don't read Arabic, or if they don't read it well enough to be able to read the Quran. Um, they seem to have a very shaky grasp on many of the tenets of Islam, and they keep on talking about restoring the caliphate. Well, the caliphate was known for its relative tolerance of other religions. I mean, both the Jews and the Christians were tolerated under the caliphate in ways that uh, you know, um, ISIS, for example, um, is clearly not prepared to tolerate. I, th I, think they, I think they are fascist movements. I think they have many of the features of European fascism. I think perhaps some of them, their organizing and principles and motivation come, in fact, directly from that. I don't think they're, they're necessarily homegrown in the Middle East. I think they're very much affected by things elsewhere. And I think very much um, prepared to use the most appalling means to, to, to achieve their ends. I mean, their ends seem to me to be very, very unclearly defined. It's very difficult to know what they want. It's, it's clearer to see what they're against, um, but very difficult to see what they want. I mean, they seem to me to be you know, really almost like gang lords who simply want control and power, but don't really know what they want to do with it. John and then Edward on the same topic. I think, um, you know, political Islam, radical political Islam, is just completely inconsistent, not just with democracy, but with pluralism and with uh, freedom. Um, what we're also seeing manifest itself, though, are state actors sponsoring non-state actors to um, almost outsource you know, state activities. If you look at Iran's financial and material support um, for Hamas, for Hezbollah, its interference in just about every single one of its neighbors. Um, there's another country in the region who's been um, using its economic wealth for uh, nefarious purposes, in my judgment. And that, that is a deep, deep concern. Thank you. Edward? Well, I think that I partly agree with Margaret, but I think one has to beware um, because the, um, there is some ideological continuity. Um, the, these people are basically Wahhabis. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at what Wahhabis did when they were building up the first <coughs> Saudi state, they went to Najaf and Karbala and they destroyed the Shia shrines there. I mean, there, there is a history. This is a particular variant of Islam, which is like extreme Protestantism. It's very iconoclastic, and uh, it's very intolerant, it's very puritanical, and it's very rigorous. Now, um, in some respects, these people may be even worse, uh, and they may also have been, because there isn't an effective caliphate or an effective state in parts of that region now, and that some of the ones that are there have mistakenly thought they could use these people for their own purposes. Um, it's got way out of control. Uh, and I think that um, we in the West certainly haven't handled it well. We've been very slow uh, to realize that this is something that affects us, uh, and indeed for which we have some responsibility. Which is, which to me, is absolutely appalling as a citizen of the United Kingdom to discover that the guy who's beheaded this American colleague of mine um, is from London. Uh, and it seems even from a relatively uh, well-heeled and uh, well-educated part of London society. I mean, this is ghastly, beyond, beyond belief. Um, but uh, so we probably haven't done a very good job in educating our own people 
um, to make sure that they are not, they do not fall prey to these kinds of ideologies. Uh, but I think the states in the region have a great deal of responsibility too. Um, I think that until very recently, these movements were heavily bankrolled and armed by countries in the Gulf, probably some of which are represented in this room, and which they are. are supposed to be uh, good friends of, of the West and uh, you know, present themselves in other contexts as moderates. Uh, I also think about Turkey, um, the country which, for which I have enormous affection and admiration. But I think that the, in the last few years, the policy of the Turkish government towards what was going on, particularly in Syria, has been either mad or deeply malign. I think it's now time to uh, open the floor. I think we've heard the invitations here. So uh, may I ask you to raise your... Don't worry about the invitation to President Erdogan's inauguration. <laughs> Not too worried about that. May I ask you to raise your hand, and um, since everybody doesn't know everybody's faces here, uh, I would very much ask you to state your name and your affiliation when you take the floor. I will start on my left-hand side over there, and then we'll, uh, we'll move rightwards. Hi, Terry. It's Steve Erlanger from the New York Times. Um, I was hoping the panel would expand a bit on the notion of challenges to what exists of the world order. I mean, I myself, having lived in Germany and in Russia and the Middle East, am very struck by the sense that Russia, which used to be a stakeholder, no longer feels like one um, for lots of reasons that we understand. And China, which has never been much of a stakeholder, wants a bigger stake. And the Middle East, which we took for granted, has gone through enormous convolutions to actually a much harsher reality now in Egypt, for instance. I mean, we like stability, but it's a very high price, I should have said. Um, so if you could talk a bit more about that, I'm particularly struck by the European part of this world order. Um, does Russia really have no stake in it? Does it want to pull it down? If so, um, does Russia and China, they begin to make noises about a whole different set of alliances with India and other countries? And I'm curious how seriously the panel takes that. Thank you. Thank you. I will take two more interventions and then I will ask the panelists to, uh, to uh, comment. I saw a hand uh, there in the back. Uh, it's, it, it seems to me, uh, okay, my name is Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Um, it seems to me, and I'm, I happen to be, as on the side, a Christian from Lebanon, okay? And uh, it seems to me that uh, people under don't really realize the connection between uh, modern fundamentalist Islam and modernity. It's really a product of modernity. <laughs> Effectively, if you take a history, it is a minority that started growing like a cancer, okay? Of course, subsidized by old money. <laughs> and of course, against those that caused it. <laughs> but when I grew up in Lebanon, I'm Greek Orthodox. You could recognize a Greek Orthodox woman from a Muslim one at the fact that the Greek Orthodox woman had a headband, <laughs> okay? Yeah. And there'd been transformation in a differentiation of that thanks to now the internet and everything. So really, what has happened is really modernity. In other words, everybody starts having uh, 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 this, this communication network, unif making your religions very uniform, and certain brands of religion marketed more than others. So I think that's what the problem is, effectively. So because if you take Islam, 97% of Islam was, not, was of the tolerant kind that preferred Christian locals to Muslim foreigners. And now it's exactly the opposite. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, when I heard um, uh, Edward's last remarks, I knew there was uh, one participant here who inevitably would take the floor, and it has now happened. Prince Turkey, you have the floor, our good friend. Yeah, Turkey Faisal, a descendant of Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab directly. Not only uh, uh, in terms of genetics, but also in terms of ideology. And uh, also, just one question about Crimea first. Is there a religious dimension in what's happening in Crimea um, in terms of different Christian sects uh, between the Russians and the Crimeans? I'm not much of a 
knowledgeable person about that part of the world. Um, on the question of, of, of uh, Wahhabis and, and so on, and I think people here, not just here, but I think many places in the way, including among Muslims, tend to throw us all in, in one pot and say they're all terrorists and, and vicious and, and so on. Um, uh, the sacking, of course, of, of, of graves and so on is unacceptable, even in Islam. Um, and in, in the mid-18th century, in our part of the world, um, sacking of cities and, and, and other uh, places, whether of worship or not, was common practice. Uh, it was not uh, something that was unusual. I mean, my, my ancestral homeland, uh, Dereya, was, was completely sacked by the Turks after Karbala and, and other places like that. So I would not attribute it to, to any particular uh, ideology or anything like that. Uh, however, to answer the question of, of, of supporting the, the ISIS and, and other such uh, uh, political Islam uh, movements, uh, I hear that accusation uh, not only addressed at the kingdom, but at other countries in the Gulf. Uh, His Excellency mentioned the Gulf states in, in, in general. I don't know if anybody has ever presented any, any such evidence uh, to the governments in the Gulf. Because uh, if people will remember that a country like Saudi Arabia has been the victim of these uh, states, of these stateless uh, persons. Uh, and uh, simply to make generalized statements like that, I think is, is misleading and maybe sometimes also perhaps uh, unhelpful. Uh, in dealing with uh, with uh, with ISIS and and other such uh, uh, groups, uh, what I can say is that uh, ISIS and and the other such fundamentalist groups that have operated not only in 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 Syria and, and Iraq, but now operating everywhere, have had uh, in the mid 90s, particularly um, at the beginning of their formation. Welcome, can you all, can you hear? I think some, something hap happened with the s s sound system. Can you hear what Prince Turkey is saying? This is not part of censorship, is it? <laughs> 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 um, um, these these groups uh, had a very welcome uh, home, if you like. In London, uh, we all remember when London was called Londonistan, um, and I think journalists and others have commented on that. So it's not just uh, Gulf states and other places in, in our part of the world that should be blamed for these uh, for these groups, but I think the blame goes uh, goes around, and it's very very distressing, of course, for for a Muslim to see that Muslims are killing each other so viciously, and uh, the caliphate as uh, our distinguished historian uh, said was a more tolerant um, um, state rather than what is being practiced in its name now uh, by, by, uh, by ISIS. And I'll stop here. I'll be speaking later, so I'll make some other comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now, I will, we, we will have another round, but I will now go back to, uh, to the panel and give them an opportunity to, um, to answer the questions. Of course, uh, uh, Prince Turki Al Faisal is, of course, the former intelligence chief of Saudi Arabia and former ambassador to both London and Washington. So he speaks with authority on these matters. Um, maybe uh, I should start with you, Edward. Well, obviously, I was aware that what I said would be considered provocative, but it was not intended as uh, personally hostile. And I did preface it by saying that I think we in the West bear a great share of responsibility and that we have severely mishandled this problem. So I think we agree on that part. There is unfortunately plenty of blame to go round, uh, but it's probably also true that um, sitting around blaming each other is not going to be the best way to solve the problem. I think uh, the only good thing about this dreadful situation in now prevailing in both Syria and Iraq is that uh, these people have behaved so abominably that uh, I think the coalition of their opponents is very broad. And I think our task now really must be to make that coalition effective and, um, 
so I think one would like to see, for example, um, some degree of understanding and cooperation between Iran and Saudi Arabia in, in, in facing up to this danger, because I think it menaces both of them as it menaces the rest of them. Thank you very much. Uh, John, would you like to comment on uh, some of the interventions here? No. What about you, Margaret? Um, well, I, I, a couple of things. I think um, we're dealing, I think, with the internationalization of radicalism, which is very difficult to contain, and, and just the nature of weapons we have now. It's very easy to move very powerful weapons around, and, and the access that people seem to have to weapons. And, of course, another problem, which we haven't talked about much, but probably will come to, is, is the whole problem of states that have failed. I mean, Libya is now a serious problem because it hasn't been able to um, establish a coherent government, and you have... I mean, it, it looks very much like Europe in the Middle Ages, where you have warlords um, who are armed to the teeth, struggling with each other and making life miserable for everyone who happens to be in the neighborhood. And then we have too many places like this in the world. Um, I think it's very, very, very dangerous. And, and now, of course, Syria and Iraq, which is falling to pieces, in ways which I think can only lead to further misery. And, and you know, how you then try and reconstitute societies like that um, is, is very difficult. And, and I do think there is something, and I agree with the speaker there, that so much of, of this, and it's to do with what Edward said earlier as well, this clinging to, to these particular identities and being absolutely rigid and refusing to accept that other people can have their own identities, I think is in part a reaction to modernity. It's, it's a fear of, of a world which is changing and, and in which identities are fluid. And I think we all feel it, but I think there are ways of reacting to, to modernity and to a complicated world other than becoming parts of these inward-looking, um, often murderous groups. And I think the question about stakeholders, I mean, that seems to me always a great worry for an international situation, uh, international order, when powerful countries don't want to play the game anymore. It doesn't matter um, that much if North Korea is not a stakeholder because it can be isolated and contained, um, although it has nuclear weapons, which, which does make it worrisome. But it does matter when Russia seems to be deciding that it doesn't want to play by the rules anymore because that will be dangerous. It will encourage others to think the same. But you know, the idea that, that, uh, that Putin has been floating, that our new best friend is China, um, I don't believe for a minute. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, the Russians are scared stiff of the demographic gap out in the Far East. They know them billions of Chinese to the south of them and not many Russians living out there. Uh, and the idea that China and India are somehow going to become best friends, it seems to me highly improbable as well. But, um, but it, I, all I can say is I do think we're in for, for very turbulent times, and we just have to hope that we, you know, those nations that continue to want to build um, a strong international order, and that's where smaller nations can play a role too, because I think you know, collectively they can do a lot. I mean, one small nation can't do a lot, but together, I think if they continue to buy into the international system, they can make a difference. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we will now have another round of questions, but I will tell you that we have to close in about uh, 10 minutes, so I will encourage you to be brief. And if I cannot give the floor to all of you who are raising your hands, there will be plenty of opportunities for the next few days to discuss this. This is supposed to be a chapeau of matters which we will drill very deep into uh, tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Uh, I will start uh, on my left-hand side there, the uh, first row. Yeah, thank you, Terry. I'm, my name is Jean Kazikhanov. Until recently, I've been with the presidential administration, and uh, as you rightly mentioned, I'm probably the only, together with our ambassador, representing here the former Soviet Union country, which is Kazakhstan, actually. And uh, I would like to uh, comment on uh, what Ms. Margaret McMillan said. No, we don't am uh, afraid of Russia occupying Kazakhstan we are more afraid of the sanctions that has been imposed against Russia that can seriously jeopardize the economic development of Kazakhstan. So what I wanted to ask uh, our panelists to comment about the sanctions, because we are feeling that the sanctions are leading to nowhere, and uh, speaking about uh, Kazakhstan and Russia, just very brief comment to give you the picture that uh, we have a border with Russia of 7,500 7, kilometers. It's the longest continental border, even longer than the border between Canada and the United States. It's already been registered in the Guinness Book. <laughs> and uh, Russia is our ally and strategic partner. 
And uh, I mean, we think that we showing a good example of uh, good neighborly relations with this country. But again, coming back to sanctions, we're seriously concerned about those sanctions that can seriously impact Kazakhstan economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kazakhanov is a very modest man. He's also the foreign minister of Kazakhstan and he's been ambassador to uh, the United Nations, to Vienna, and he is assuming within uh, the next few weeks his new position as ambassador to St. James's Court. Uh, then I think it was a the gentleman uh, there, right? Uh, my name is Mark Jarrett. I've written a book on the Congress of Vienna. I'll be speaking tomorrow. So I wanted to ask about hard power, which you mentioned, and I especially wanted to ask the Foreign Minister of Canada, but all the representatives. At the Congress of Vienna, uh, there was also an issue with Poland and the Tsar. Russia at that time was very interested in annexing the con uh, Poland, and the British and the Austrians were very much opposed, but they did have this problem. The Tsar said, well, I have 200,000 men there and I'm not going to move them. So they, were, so they tried to use soft power. And I want to draw the analogy with Poland because in 1939 there was also the issue of protecting Poland and Britain and France of course got involved uh, in World War II because of that. But again they couldn't do that much to help the Poles as you know. And then in 1945 it was the Polish situation again which led to the Cold War because Stalin was supposed to have elections there, didn't. Truman got annoyed. So drawing that analogy, I just wanted to ask what hard power resources do you think could be used in the situation in the Ukraine? And if hard power resources cannot be used, what soft power resources do you think might be effective? That's the question. Much. Uh, then uh, I think I will go uh, to the gentleman there and then I will give the floor to the gentleman over there. And you will be the last speaker before we go back to the panel. And then tomorrow, you can ask whatever questions you like and have whatever interventions you want on the same topic. You have Thank you. Uh, Andrea Larion of Gate Institute. I have one comment and one question. Comment concerning, Edward, your uh, comments concerning Russia and Ukraine, which I understood you think that it is some kind of the same identity or very similar identity or some kind of uh, common origin, same polity and so on. I think you're just maybe involuntarily repeating a very substantial portion of Mr. Putin's propaganda. Uh, it's incorrect. Uh, these two nations have very different origin. Uh, from an institutional point of view, origin of Russia is Grand Principality of Vladimir. Uh, origin of Ukraine is Grand Principality of Galich and Volinia. It's very different places. Symbolize, symbols of these two nations are very different. Andrei Bogolubsky for Russia and uh, the Grand Prince, or after that King, Daniela Romanovich, uh, which is a very different personality. From institution point of view, if for a more modern period of time, it would be certainly Ivan the Third or Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the Terrible in for Russia, and the Parishka Siege uh, with uh, Khmelnytsky, Sergei Dachny, uh, for Ukraine. Very different places, with a very different institutions, with very different habits, with diff very different behavior. One polity from 17th century. Uh, Austria and Hungary were in the same polity since mid since 17th century. Nobody would say that these two nations have the same identity. Uh, as for so-called Russian minority in East Ukraine, there was no single case of persecution of Russian minority uh, in East Ukraine or South Ukraine or anywhere for all these 23 years of independence. There was no pro-Russian parties, there was no pro-Russian movement, there was no pro-Russian slogans. Just And actually, still there is no, after this uh, war of Mr. Putin's against Ukraine, still there is no pro-Russian party in Ukraine. The, uh, in Crimea, there was only one pro-Russian party that got even 4% in election, not in national election, in regional election in Crimea. It shows what is the support for the so-called minority. So just you can check the facts and you would get much clear understanding of just absolutely in incorrect uh, understanding of the situation in Ukraine. But my question, Margaret, to you. You, you provided very interesting comparison of the results of this um, International Congress of Vienna versus, let's say, Paris after uh, the second of Napoleonic Wars and after the First World War from which uh, the conclusion is quite clear that Vienna 
Congress happened to be much more successful in creating conditions for peace in Europe for almost half a century, now, unlike uh, Paris. If we add one more Congress, or actually not one more, two more Congresses uh, of that kind, we add after the events of the, after the Second World War, Yalta and Potsdam, which provided almost seven decades non-aggression in Europe. Should we conclude from this comparison that Yalta and Potsdam happen to be at least as successful as Vienna, or even more successful than Vienna because it is a longer period of relative peace in Europe? Would you say so? If not, why? Or if you say yes, could you explain what particular factors provided such a success for Yalta and Potsdam, let's say, versus Vienna? I think we have food for thought here. Thank you. Uh, now I will give uh, the floor to um, the last speaker uh, this evening. I'm Alexei Horany. I'm professor of comparative politics from Kiev. Yesterday we celebrated our Independence Day and it was very peculiar celebration because directly from the parade soldiers went to the battlefront fighting with the Russian aggression. And I would like to say some more things about so-called ethnic conflict in Ukraine. There's no ethnic conflict in Ukraine. It's very important, no linguistic conflict in, in Ukraine. It's very important to understand. Uh, I was at the front line with the so-called volunteer battalions. Volunteer battalions. Most of these battalions are Russian speakers from Donbass. And they are saying in Russian, in Russian, we are fighting for Ukrainian Donbass. So the language issue or even ethnic uh, identity is not the main issue here. I can elaborate on that, but we can, we can have it later. And my second point is suddenly because our Kazakh uh, friend, I would say, yeah. So you raise the, you raise the issue of sanctions. So. So I would like to remind to all of the audience that in 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal, which was the third largest in the world, British, French, and Chinese combined together. And we received so-called security assurances. And unfortunately, it, does, it didn't work in Crimea. It, it's not working right now. So actually, the question is, what the West is doing. And I believe that sanctions are actually very li limited and unfortunately belated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I will start with uh, John. What is the West doing? I <coughs> just respond to both on the, the issue of sanctions. Uh, in my judgment, I mean, you do really do need the EU, the United States, Canada, Norway, others, for it to be meaningful. I think we were probably too little too late. Um, they have had not much of an effect on the micro level. On the macro level, they've led to capital flight. Uh, they've led to the instability uh, in the economy. They've led to uh, the likely reality that they're in recession. I think we've just struggled on how to respond to it in, um, in, a, in, a, in a 21st century way. In terms of the comment about um, Ukraine, I mean, as far as hard power, I don't think there's an appetite, certainly not in the United States, not in Canada, not in NATO, for you know, military intervention. Uh, I think, you know, if there's many more things like um, MH17, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, I can say, you talk about hard power, soft power. Um, I uh, liked when Hillary Clinton spoke about uh, smart power. <laughs> I think we need more of that. Thank you, John. I'll move to Edward. Well, I'm obviously not setting up as an accomplished historian of uh, Ukraine and Russia. There are people here who know much more about that than I do. And I don't, nor do I wish to pontificate about the identities concerned. Um, I, 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 I agree, I think it's impressive that um, the so-called rebellion uh, has been confined to a fairly small area uh, in the Donbass and um, uh, in then clearly not representing the population as a whole. Uh, and you know, in, I, when we were here in June, um, we had a conference on um, Holocaust education. There was a lady from Kharkiv, and I asked her, I said, you know, it must be a uh, kind of dangerous place uh, to, or not very comfortable place to live at the moment. And she said, well, it's true that there are 
worrying things, but there is no pro-Russian um, manifestation of any kind. And Kharkiv, as I'm sure people know, is a predominantly Russian-speaking city. So I absolutely concede that. Uh, my, uh, I mean, at the same time, I think what Putin's tactics are to get uh, Ukraine to have to reconquer these eastern areas by military force, which I think with a good deal of restraint uh, it is trying to do, but a lot of people are getting killed. And the danger then is, of course, that uh, that enables the Russians to say, look, uh, you know, this is a government that's attacking its own people, and maybe some of the inhabitants uh, do share that view. So I think this is something we have to be... But mainly, I was talking about, uh, in trying to answer Terrier's question, um, to empathise a bit with what the Russian Putin and the Russians who support him are feeling, and whether we may have made mistakes. I don't think the European Union is an expansionist power, but I think that um, it hasn't very clearly thought out what its policy is uh, towards its immediate neighbours to the east. Uh, I, don't, I think it made a mess of its uh, policy towards Turkey. And in a slightly different way, I think it's made a mess of its policy to the Ukraine. I, just if I have 30 seconds left, um, I'd like to come back to 1814, which I think is in a little bit of danger of being the poor relation in this discussion. Um, it's uh, wonderful uh, that we have Mark Jarrett here, and we will hear a lot more about it um, tomorrow. But I think this is the speciality of this. There have been umpteen conferences about 1914 and the legacy and the lessons of 1914. But the fact that we have linked it, we are here in Austria, I like the thought that it might be the most important international meeting in Austria since the Congress of Vienna. I don't know whether that can be right, but uh, I think that, um, it, 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 that there are very interesting examples we should be pondering. And um, I want to do a little commercial for a friend of mine. Uh, in a moment, you're all going to go across to the Great Hall of the Schloss, and there will be a reception. And during that reception, there will be music. And it's live music played by two artists. Uh, who are professional cons a pianist and a violinist, uh, and uh, they have uh, specially agreed to do a program of music composed in or around 1814 oh, by Beethoven, by Schubert, by Franz Xaver Mozart, the son of uh, Wolfgang Avendez, uh, and I think by Hummel. Um, now, it'll, we'll all have a great deal to say to each other, and we will all uh, be wanting to swig away at the... Um, Prosecco or whatever it is that the South Global Seminar is providing. But I hope that you will take a moment also to listen to that music and try and immerse yourself in the Austria of 1814 in preparation for the discussion tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Edward and then Margaret. Well, I, I now realize I'm standing between you all and the reception and the music, um, but I'll be, so I'll be very brief. Um, on sanctions, um, I think sanctions can work. I mean, we tend to expect them to work very quickly, and they're a difficult instrument, and they're, they, 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 they need pressure, and they need finesse. But they did work against the apartheid regime in South Africa in the end, and I think we should remember that. And, and of course, Canada, I think, really did play an, an important part in, in, in helping to broker a, a coalition on that. Um, I think, you know, I think the... the Issue of identity, I think, is a very interesting one, and it, of course, is hugely important for Ukraine, but also for many other parts of the world. And I think the thing about identities is they're not fixed, they change. And I think you can see this happening today in Iraq, that what had been religious identities, I mean, Shi and Sunni have lived side by side for centuries, um, as have Christians and Jews in Iraq. Um, often intermarrying, particularly among Shi and Sunni. These were not hard and fast identities, but you can see them now changing into something different. And the parallel I have in mind, I mean, I, I use the word ethnic identities, because it seems to me this is somehow what happens. And the same thing can ha and has happened in the past with linguistic identities. People who live in villages, one part of the village speaking German, the other part speaking Hungarian, have got on for centuries until it becomes often used by unscrupulous leaders. It becomes something that they use to try and turn people against each other. And so I think identities are more fluid than we like to think. Um, and of course, what Putin would like to happen, and he's even, I gather, using language like this, is to see Russian speakers in Ukraine seeing themselves as Russian nationals, which I think is, is of course, would be very bad for Ukraine. And 
in the referendum, in the what was it referendum when when you decided whether or not to become independent from the um, from the Soviet Union? I think even in eastern Ukraine there was majority in favor of independence um, among the Russian speaking areas. So at that point the identities clearly were were, were complicated, and people can have multiple identities um, on the co on the Congress issue. Um, Vienna was more successful because the objective conditions for peace were there than the Paris Peace Conference. I'm not going to talk about Yalta and Potsdam because they weren't those sort of conferences. Those were wartime conferences to sort out what would happen afterwards. Um, what brought the peace, I think, the long peace of, of the Cold War was not so much Yalta and Potsdam, it was nuclear weapons, um, which luckily persuaded both sides they better not start fighting with each other. Um, so if I may leave it there. Thank you very much all. I think I think this has been, there will be plenty of opportunities to discuss this also at the backdrop of the chamber music. Let me say this was terrific, it's very engaged and very inspiring for our deliberations uh, tomorrow and a very good backdrop, I think, for what we're going to do for the rest of our stay here. So um, with this, thank you all, first to the panelists, then to the participants. Thanks to our chairman. Thank you. Thank you. So let us march towards the palace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, aren't you guys? Oh, no. I'm sitting right up to